Amen. Well, good morning. As uh, as Pastor Brian said a little while ago, that we we were honored by the Lord to baptize thirty one people last Sunday. Amen. Amen. And uh, and I just want to tell you something that that was something that was really awesome that happened uh, a couple of Saturday nights ago. Uh, I was at home. I was with uh, some te- uh, some team members, some visitors. My wife was back in the bedroom. I was in the office with them. And she came in and she said, uh, did you guys hear those gunshots? And we said, no, we didn't hear anything. She said, like a couple of rounds of gunshots had happened. And uh, it sounded like it was just here in Amber Court. And, uh, and you know, we didn't know what that was and, and all of that. Well, well, come to find out, it was, a, it was an, a military soldier who basically, from the report, was annoyed with his family. And he went into the Amber Court area and he started shooting people. My, my report says he killed six people, wounded others, and then shot himself. Uh, that was on Saturday night a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was one young man in that shooting. His name is Pius. And, uh, and he started running from those bullets. He actually got a piece of shrapnel in his nose. And he said while he was running... Uh, all he could think of was this young man named Matthias, who is our bass player and sound guy. Stand up, Matthias. All he could think about was Matthias inviting him to come to Acacia Community Church. And on his way from running from the bullets on Saturday night, he came to Acacia on Sunday morning, two weeks ago, and under the, in the service with Pastor Andrew preaching, Pius got saved. Hallelujah. And last Sunday, Pius was baptized along with his friend Isaac. And they're here this morning. I just want them to stand up and let's praise the Lord for these two young men. Where are they? Amen. And, uh, and both of these young men also signed up for my small group. So they're going to be in my small group this Tuesday night. Amen. So let's praise the Lord for what He's doing. Isn't it amazing? Sometimes you think people are just not listening. Sometimes you think they're just not paying attention. But I want you to understand, we're just called to sow some seed. Say amen. And we leave the rest up to the Lord. Now if it takes the Lord using bullets to scare someone to come to Jesus, we'll take that. Amen. And so we praise the Lord that these young men are in the kingdom of God and they're followers of the Lord Jesus. Say amen. Amen. So God is good. So we've begun a series through the book of Philippians and we're in Philippians chapter 1 and uh, we're just going to look at a couple of verses, verses 9, 10, and 11. So if we can just look together at those verses. And we've talked a lot about this book already. We've given a lot of introduction and a lot of... A lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts about, listen, Paul experienced and expressed joy in the midst of a jail cell. Say amen. And I don't know about you and I don't know about me sometimes, but man, I want to have that kind of heart. I want to have that kind of attitude that no matter what's going on around me, no matter what the circumstances are around me, I want to try my best to experience that joy and also to share that joy with other people. And, you know, it's amazing when circumstances come, when crisis comes, many times we can be robbed of our joy. And as I told you, the definition of joy, I gave you quite a few definitions, but just be reminded that joy is a permanent possession that is given to us as the Spirit of Christ lives in us. Say amen. That joy is something that that is a supernatural satisfaction in God's sovereignty over our life and over our circumstances. And so as we sit here this morning, you know, my heart has been broken. I know yours has over what's going on in South Sudan. And uh, and our brothers, our neighbors, many of our Ugandan friends are there. and, uh, And we just need to pray that God would be sovereign even over that. Say amen. And that God would just show Himself mighty in the midst of that uh, very terrible time right now. And, uh, and, and so this morning, I just want you to hear, I believe, the heart of a pastor, the heart of a missionary, as Pastor Paul is praying for his sheep at Philippi, as this missionary Paul is praying over this body of believers, 
I believe it's a prayer also that I find myself many times praying over us here at Acacia Community Church. And Paul says, listen, he says, this is my prayer. Are we together? Philippians 1 verse 9, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the righteousness, with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ to the glory and praise of God. Father, this morning I want to say thank you. Thank you for this day we have together. Thank you for this body of believers, these friends and families and co-laborers in your vineyard. Thank you that you've called us together and, and we're here this morning and I pray that you equip us. I pray that you establish us in our faith. I pray this morning that we're encouraged by your word, that we're encouraged by the fellowship of believers. In Spirit of God, I yield to you and I pray that you have freedom to speak to my heart and speak through my voice. And may your word by your spirit speak truth into us. May we understand that true joy is ours. We experience that true joy as we live our life here in East Africa. I pray that our ears would be open to hear what you want to say to us today. And we pray together in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You know, this morning as I was thinking about this passage of Scripture and I was just reading over it, one of the thoughts that came to my mind is it's amazing that Paul is praying for the people at Philippi. And I believe his prayer is... If you sum it all up would be he's praying for you and I and the people there to experience what true joy really is. Now, as I look at this, I came up with an outline and very seldom do I have outlines as as homolytically correct as this one is, Andrew. Uh, but I just want us to look now. Now, listen carefully. If you and I are going to live out this true joy, if you and I are going to really experience the true joy that we're supposed to have, that we need to have, here's what Paul prays over us. And I'm going to read you the outline. Is that okay? Here's what Paul's prayer is. Number one, that we would abound in love. Number two, that we would in our own lives, listen, we would approve what is best. In other words, we would pursue excellence. Number three, that we would abide in righteousness. That we would remain in righteousness, bearing the fruit of righteousness. And number four, that we would always, listen, we would always do all things to glorify God. I'm telling you, when we put that together in our life, when we put that as, a, as even a progression in our lives, I want to tell you what happens. Joy is just going to squirt out of you. Amen? It's just going to ooze out of you. I mean, listen... A mosquito will bite you and fly away singing there's power in the blood. Amen? I mean, that's the joy we're talking about. This the joy of the Lord, the sweetness of the Lord in our life. And, and, and so I just want us to talk about these things together, just looking at the verses. He said, first of all, in verse 9, and this is my prayer. This is my continuous prayer. That's what he's saying. It's just not a one-time prayer. Paul says, my heart, my life, my attitude, I'm just continually praying. I'm just continually in this attitude of praying for you. It wasn't just once in a while, but he says, my continual prayer, listen, is, is what? That your love may abound more and more. That your love may overflow. In fact, the idea of your love abounding, listen, abounding in love... It's the idea of a river that's flowing out of its banks. And, and when that river flows out of, its bank, out of its banks, what does that water do? It goes and it just saturates everything around. It makes plants grow. It makes the grass greener. It makes, it, 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 I mean, everything enjoys it. You know, as believers, when you and I begin to abound in love, guess what happens? It ministers to people around us. You know what's missing in many of our Christian lives? It's love. We get so busy with ministry, so busy doing our stuff, 
doing our projects, working with our hands, that we just forget simply to love people around us. Listen. Let me just read 1 Corinthians 13 as a reminder. Is that okay? Let's just look at 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men, and if I speak in the tongues of angels, but I don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries, and if I have all knowledge, and if I have a faith that I can move mountains, but if I have not Love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor, and I surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Can I remind you of something? Anything minus love equals zero. Anything you do minus love equals zero. Nothing. Tewali. Teddy. Nothing. It's, a, it's amazing. And, and so many times I can be so guilty of doing my project. So guilty of being minis- doing my ministry and being busy that I just forget to love people around me. Listen, it doesn't matter how wonderful your ministry is, how great your faith is, all of, all of your spiritual gifts don't really matter if you don't have love for your neighbor. Amen? And you remember, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 22. Just as a reminder, all these are reminders. All of you guys have heard this stuff. You just haven't heard it from me today. Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with some of your heart. Does your Bible say that? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Identical to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commands. Listen, folks, if we don't have a simple love for one another in the body of Christ, if we don't have a simple love for our neighbor, whether he's saved or lost, we still have to love him. Sometimes I can be negative. I know you find that hard to believe. Sometimes I can be critical. Sometimes I can complain about people or a people group. And it seems many times that I do that. In fact, it annoys my wife and my daughter when they're complaining about someone. And I simply say this. Well, you know, that's still a little lamb that Jesus died for. Oh, it just rubs them the wrong way. But I have to look at myself in the mirror and say the same thing. I can't be critical of other people. There's still a lamb that Jesus died for. Amen? And listen, we have to, if we, we, and listen, we have to abound in love. It just has to flow out of us. It has to be a part of people walking alongside of us and saying, look at that person. They just have love. And he says, look, look what he says in the text. He says that this is my prayer. I'm continually praying, listen, that your love may abound more and more. And how does he want that love to abound? In fact, one little translation says, wave upon wave. Just it keeps going, it keeps going. Wave upon wave. Love just flows out of us. And just as a reminder, listen to Romans 5.5. 5. Just as a reminder, I quoted this two weeks ago. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Can I remind you, this love is the agape love. It's not the emotional love. 
It's a love of the will. It's a love of choice. It's a love of sacrifice. It's a love that says, I would die for someone else. It's a love that says, I'm going to be here. I've got your back. I'm going to take care of you. Love that says, I'm always seeking someone else's highest good over my own. A love that doesn't gripe or complain about circumstances. A love that says, I love you, period, without conditions or strings attached. And Paul says, I want that kind of love to abound more and more in you. Listen to what Jesus said over in John chapter 13. This is just an introduction. Is everybody okay? Listen to John 13, 34 and 35. I love this verse. Jesus speaking to his disciples about his departure. And he says, a new command I give you, love one another. How do I love one another? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you attend Acacia Community Church. Is that what it says? By this, all will know you're my disciples if you're a Baptist. What does it say? Listen. The world's going to recognize that you're walking with Him, that you're a follower of Jesus, that you love Him. Listen, when you start showing love for one another, can you do that? No, not naturally. Can you do that supernaturally? Yes, because the Holy Spirit has been given to our hearts. He's been poured into our hearts. And the Holy Spirit in me gives me the ability to love you. Even when you don't like me. Even when you talk bad about me. Even when you're critical. The Spirit of God in me says, I can love you anyway. Terry can't. But the Spirit of God in me can. Praise God. And Paul says, my prayer is that that love, that love, that agape, sacrificial, willing love would abound. It would just overflow out of you. I don't know about you, but I want to say amen to that prayer. I want to say I receive that. Pray that for me. I want that kind of love. Don't you want that kind of love? And when that kind of love's on display, guess what happens? Joy. Unspeakable. And full of glory. Woo! Glory to God. So he says, listen, I want this love to abound, to overflow. And listen, this love abounds more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight. We know the word knowledge is that word epignosis. And that word really means, listen, it's a heart knowledge. It's not just a head knowledge. It's not just knowing all the facts. It's not just knowing about God. It's knowing God. It's not just knowing about someone. It's knowing them personally, intimately, walking alongside of someone else. He's saying that's the kind of love that we need to have. For one another. And he said in that love. Listen. In knowledge and depth of insight. And that whole idea depth of insight. Many of your translations may say in knowledge and in judgment. Some of your translations use the word judgment there. Everyone has my inferior version. Huh? Discernment. So so listen. To, to understand. Knowledge. And judgment. You know. I have a problem. I have lots of problems. But here's my biggest problem, Justin. Sometimes I talk before I know all the facts. Sometimes I express an opinion before I really know everything that's going on. And I know I'm probably the only one in this room that has that problem. Sometimes I'm... I'm listen, sometimes I let my emotions... Take over. Sometimes I think without speaking. My father used to say, No, I better not quote that. Never mind. (laughs) My mouth would engage before I put my brain in gear. My mouth would just take off. When he's talking about having this knowledge and depth of insight, he's talking about, listen, make sure you know the facts. Make sure you know things clearly before you bring judgment on someone else. And in the meantime, until you gather all the facts, you love them. And listen, after you gather all the facts, 
You love them. Nothing's going to change that. Okay? So he says, I'm praying that this love of yours would just abound more and more. It would just overflow its banks. It would just, everybody around you would be affected that they see you're walking with God. Now I want you to see verse 10. He says in verse 10, listen, that you will approve what is best. He says, so that you may be able to discern what is best. And you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Listen, approving what is best. Let me give you another word. Pursuing excellence. Many of us in our Christian life, unfortunately, have settled for good. Are you hearing me? We've said, okay, I'm going to choose good over bad instead of pursuing excellent over good. You hear what I'm saying? We're just mediocre Christians. We're just mediocre in our life, in our commitment, in our love for one another, in our integrity, in our character. We start, we have a comparative theology. You know, I'm, I'm good compared to. And you know, I've never murdered anyone, so I must be pretty good. I've been faithful to my wife, and we have comparative righteousness. I remember one time I was preaching a message similar to this in America and my mentor was in the in the congregation. And I remembered at the end of the service, I said, I said, Dr. Simmer, man, we really raised the bar today. And he said, oh, no. Oh, no. Jesus has already raised the bar. We've just got to get to where he is. He's already set the standard. Say amen. And many times, listen, we, we, we li- we're living our lives and we're not. Going after the best. We're not struggling and striving to do what is best in our life. In fact, he says, listen, when I look at this thing about abounding in love, it's a prayer for my heart. But when I look about this thing of approving what is best, it's a prayer for my mind. That my mind, listen, would be renewed by his spirit, renewed by his word. Say amen. He says, listen, so that you may be able to discern, to approve. It's the ability to pick correctly. It's the ability to to test metals for their purity. It's the ability, in those days it was used many times about a coin, that you could shake coins together and you could hear this one was counterfeit. And it would be good for nothing but be thrown off. Paul used the word in 1 Corinthians 9.27 when he says, I Buffet my body. I beat my body every day. I bring my body under subjection every day so that I won't be a castaway or a counterfeit. The reference meaning a counterfeit coin that you shake and it's no good and you just throw it onto the street. Paul said if we're not disciplined every day that way. And that's what Paul is saying here. Listen, my prayer is that you'll be disciplined. My prayer is, listen, that that you will attain, that you will strive after, that you will go after what is best, that you will pursue excellence. You know, how do we do that? He says, so that you may be able to discern what is best and that you may be pure and you may be blameless. C.S. Lewis said this, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered to us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go making mud pies in the slum, because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the beach. We are far too easily pleased. Do you know why? Because we've settled for good. We've stopped, best. We've stopped pursuing excellence. And he says, listen, my prayer is that you would approve what is best. And listen, that you would be pure and you would be blameless. I want to talk to you a little bit about that idea of being pure and being blameless. 
I want to just try to explain what that word actually means. In those days, of course, everything was made with pottery. The pots, the dishes, the cups, the bowls, everything was made with pottery. And there's a lot of money when you're starting to make pottery. You know, you put the thing on the wheel and you do everything you have to do to shape it. And then you put it in the fire. And many times when it comes out of the fire, it has a small crack. So what those vendors would do they had this wax that they would just put over that crack to cover it. And then whatever glaze or paint they would use on the outside, they would cover that up. So to the naked eye, you and I would just go in and we would buy this pot and buy this bowl and buy this cup that has this wax on it. We would take it home and of course as soon as it's put to the fire, what happens? It leaks, it's useless, it's no good. And so this term being pure, I want you to hear carefully what it says. This term of being pure means we get our English word sincere. The Latin word sincera was placed on the back of dishes at that time. To say that, listen, this dish, this ornament, this bowl, this pottery is light approved. It was held up to the light. Are you hearing that? Are you getting that? It it was approved by the light. In other words, if you were an experienced shopper, you wouldn't just buy a pot. You would take that pot, you would take it out to the sun, and you would hold it up, and the light would expose what? The crack. It would expose the wax. You know, I, I just wrote this in my notes so I wouldn't forget but, but listen to this. It, it, it means to be pure, transparent, to be sun-tested, and that's sincere. Sun-tested is the Latin word. To be without wax. Did you hear that? To be without wax. I think that's what Jose just said also. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Now listen carefully. If your life and my life is held up to the light of God's Word, would it be without wax? Or would there be a lot of fakery, hypocrisy, deceptions, lies, flesh, sensuality you see the light of god's word exposes all of that so what is paul's prayer you know what his prayer is for us you know what his prayer was for those people at philippi that your life would be pure that your life would be without wax that your life would be light approved that it would pass the test when the light of the gospel of christ comes That's why Jesus said in John 3 that many people don't come to the light because they know their deeds will be exposed, be brought out into the open. Instead, they want to hide in darkness and they want to put on a mask. That's what hypocrisy is. To say, I'm fine right here. But don't bring the light here. And folks, here's the reality. We're all cracked pots. Amen. We're all cracked pots. Every one of us. And Paul's saying, listen, here's my prayer. When you stand before Christ, because he says, listen, that you'll be blameless until the day of Christ. In other words, it becomes a lifestyle until you get home. Amen. And he says, listen, I want you to be pure My prayer is that you'll you'll be able to discern, you'll be able to know, you'll be able to approve what is best, and you'll be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Being pure, being transparent. What does it mean to be blameless? You know, when, when I teach pastors, I teach a class on the role, the qualifications, the call of a pastor. And in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1, both of those verses say 
that the elder, the pastor, the leader must be blameless, must be above reproach. Can I tell you what that literally means? There cannot be a finger of accusation pointed at you. That's what that means. That means your life has to be blameless. Your life, listen, you have to live your life in such a way that you're not going to put a stumbling block in front of someone else. Can we just read together Romans chapter 14? Romans 14, let's begin in verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Say amen. Instead, make up your mind. Right here, right now, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I'm fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed, if your brother is troubled because of what you eat, you're no longer doing what? Acting in love. Do not by your eating, do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating. It's not a matter of drinking. But it's a matter of righteousness. Say amen. It's a matter of peace. It's a matter of joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who pleases Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Those two phrases, pleasing to God is pure, approved by men is blameless. And that's what Paul's prayer is. That you and I would be pure. That you and I would be blameless. That we would not allow things in our life, listen carefully, that would hurt someone else's walk with Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test everything. Hold on to what is good. And the next verse in the King James says, Abstain from the very appearance of evil. If it appears evil, it's evil. Say amen. But you see, here's what happens. We begin to just accept things. We begin to tolerate things. We begin to allow things into our life. We don't blush anymore. We have no shame anymore. We're not shocked anymore. And because we're not shamed, because we're not ashamed, because we're not shocked, what do we do? We just allow things that we never would have allowed early in our Christian life. And we stop being pure and being blameless. So Paul says, that's my prayer. You want to have true joy? Listen, you know the most miserable Christian here this morning is the one who compromised last night. The one who compromised on Friday. But you know the Christian with joy in his heart, in his life, is the one who says, man, I, I want to be pure out before God and I want to be blameless before those around me. I don't want to have a finger of accusation pointed at me in my walk with God. Say amen. So listen, he says in verse 11, he says, I, I want you also to abide in righteousness. He says that you will be filled with the fruit of righteousness. And how does that righteousness come? How does that fruit come? It comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and to the praise of God. Listen, he says that you will abide in righteousness, that you'll be free, filled with with the fruit of righteousness. John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. John 15, 5, He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him will bring forth much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. But when we are filled 
in Him, when we're filled with this fruit of righteousness. And I'll just give you another word for that fruit of righteousness. It's good works. See, when we, when we progress to start loving people, and we progress, listen carefully, we progress not only to start loving people, but we progress to start living a life of integrity and character. You know what's going to happen? We're going to start producing good works. There's going to be fruit. What does Ephesians 2.10 say? You are His workmanship. Created. Created what? In Christ Jesus for good works. We're His craftsmanship. And we've been created for good works. And Paul says, listen, my prayer is that your love would abound and your good works would also abound. And that you'll do all of it for the praise of God. And glory of God. It's never about you. It's never about me. It's never about our ministry. It's about Him being glorified. Amen. Woo! God is good. Say amen. Listen. When John Wesley was away at university... His mother would write him all kinds of notes and letters and things like that. And I just want to read an excerpt from one of the letters that he received from his mother. Are you listening? Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, whatever obscures your sense of God, or takes off the delight for spiritual things, whatever increases the authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin. What sweet counsel from a mother over her son. You know, I, I just want you and I to stand together right now. And here's what I want to do. I just want us all to stand and pray as our uh, praise team comes. And some of you may be here this morning with a New Living Translation Bible. And I want to read these verses to you from the New Living Translation as a prayer this morning. And I want you to stand together with me, please. And Paul says this from the New Living Translations, Philippians 1 9 through 11. Let's bow together. This is our prayer. I pray that your love for each other will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in your knowledge. And in your understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters. So that you may live pure and blameless lives until Christ returns. May you always, always, always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. Those good things that are produced in your life by Christ Jesus. For this will bring much glory and much praise to God.